The True Ambition Podcast with John Zink is brought to you by IT Avalon. IT Avalon, IT staffing and professional services done right. Visit our sponsor at itavalon.com. Now, welcome to True Ambition. This is John Zink. Welcome to the True Ambition Podcast. I'm very happy today to be joined by Mr. Tom Patty. Thanks for being here. John, great to be here with you. So you and I met years ago up in Reno through a mutual friend named Brian Seligman. The infamous, great, and legendary friend of everybody, Brian Seligman. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we were up there for uh, Mike Tyson was uh, doing a one-man show. Mm-hmm. And uh, Brian said, my friend Tom's coming. He's known Mike forever, and uh, it's going to be a surprise. So we're at the Silver Legacy. Place is packed. Mike's up there on stage. And uh, just his one-man show is awesome. It is. You know, to, uh, to hear. Because there's so many stories about Mike that, uh, you know, a lot of them are, you know, made up through uh, whatever sources come out and uh, make up information through the media. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it was great to see and hear him give his take on everything. I learned things in that show. I, now I lived with Mike since he was 15, we were 14, 15, I think 15 years old. And I was 17, 18. And watching that show, because Mike you know, was a very reserved guy, a very quiet guy. He came, came from a rough neighborhood and, and, a, and a tough childhood. So it wasn't like, you know, it was like, hey guys, and you share, you know, I used to live in abandoned buildings and my mom was a drug addict. And you know, you don't really share these things. But he got up on stage and he revealed and I, more than anything, and even myself, but you walked away and you're like, oh, I got it. Wow. I, now I understand. Like, how did he go through the money? How come there was dysfunction in his life? How come these terrible things in the end when he talks about losing his daughter Exodus? And he's emotional about that. And it's still to this day a void in his life. And you're like, he's human. Right. He's a man. He's you know, gone through trials and tribulations and he has... Feelings. It's really not that iron mic with the tough veneer. It's that's a human being right there, expressing and sharing some very personal details of his life. His father was a was a you know, was a um, a pimp, and his mother was you know again a drug addict, and they barely got by. Right. So, anyways, it was. I, I thought it was very honest, very courageous, and very honest for Mike to be out there and just lay it on the line. It was. It was incredible because my wife, Carissa. We got done and she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she was, we were laughing in tears. I mean, just the the whole spectrum of everything that he went through, it it was really impressive to see it. And, you know, until I did the research and found out, you know, we'll talk more about it here in a second about how you two are connected, you and Mike Tyson, um, did the research to see kind of where you came from. But Brian said, Tom's known Mike for pretty much his whole life and Mike has no idea he's here. So you're down in the front row and it's about halfway through the show and Mike It turned- was the, actually wasn't even. It was about 25 30% in the show. Oh, was and, it? Yeah, and then Mike looked over he's like <gasps> <laughs> he goes MF and Top Patty. And then every time he would say something about cuss or something else that you guys went through, he goes, "You remember Tom? You remember what happened to Tom?" Yeah. And it was really cool and then we got to meet him afterwards. I was super surprised at how short he was because seeing him on TV, mm-hmm. I just always think of him as a monster. Right. Because he stood maybe about here on me or something like that. Yeah, but, but then you're a reached, big guy. You're five. I'm, I'm like six, three. I'm sorry, six, six, uh, four, five. Uh, six, yeah, you're a big guy though. Yeah. So Mike's, honestly, Mike's 5'11. Okay. So I was just he's surprised. Thick, like you, he's thick and powerful. So, but he's also bigger than life. I mean, he's an enigma. There's Mike Tyson. His personality, his aura is bigger than, it's bigger than life. Well, he reached out and shook my hand. And then I saw a size because yeah. the size of his hands just engulfed my hand. And I've got a large hand. And uh, it, it, was, it was really cool. So what I want to do is dig into a little bit of how you and Mike met. So you, I, in doing research, your father also trained with Customato, correct? Yes. Yep. What year was that? So my dad trained in the 40s and 50s with Cus when he was a young teenager, okay? And, and to give a little, little background and a little bit of a story. So my dad 
grew up on the Lower East Side, New York, and he didn't really have much of a father. Um, my, you know, my dad's grandfather was in organized crime. He was very, uh, he was a consigliere of the, of the Lucchese family. So okay. he, was, he was way up there. My dad's dad was in that kind of path of life. So my, he was oftentimes away, as they say back in New York, he was uh, up in the farm, you know, he was doing time. So my dad grew up on his own in the streets of New York. And he eventually found his way to this gym, Gramercy Gym on 14th Street. And a lot of the guys from the neighborhood, a lot of the Italian kids from the neighborhood started training there and fighting there and being good, you know, to defend themselves on the street. You know, streets were tough. So, so my dad and Floyd Patterson were stable mates. They trained together. They won the Golden Gloves together. They sparred together. Floyd was a lightweight, welterweight, middleweight, as my dad was. So for years, they trained together and, and had, had uh, done that. My dad later left Cuss. He went away. A lot of the guys were getting involved in organized crime, which was natural. My dad had an open door possibility, but he said, I don't want that. If I'm going to grow up and have a family, I don't want that to be my family because of what he saw the damage it did to his childhood. So he went off in the, in the military. He did you know, four years in the, in the Navy Air Corps and, uh, and came back and left Cuss. Okay, I'll kind of touch back on this later. So Cuss never forgot him for leaving him. So, um, so I go to New York with my dad after high school, and we see Nikki, one of Cuss's fighters. He's involved in the, with the, yeah, the Italian organizations. And he's like, well, you're boxing out in California. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd like to stay here. And he goes, you want to train with Cuss? I'm like, is that possible? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. He goes, let me give a phone call. So... Sunday before I'm flying home, Monday morning, I get a phone call from Nikki. He says, Cuss is expecting your phone call. So I call Cuss right away. And, and I said, uh, you know, he answers the phone and he says, hello. And I said, uh, Cuss, this is Tom Patty. He goes, you know, your father left me, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, Cuss, I think so. He goes, well, why do you want to be a fighter? I said, well, Cuss, I want to be middleweight champion of the world. And I think you can help me. Based on that answer, he invited me up the next day. Subsequent to that, I had seen him speak with people on the phone. So hold on a second. How old were you when you had that conversation with Cuss? So I was 17 or 18. I think 18. 17, okay. just turned 18. I think just turned 18. And, um, and so I have just graduated high school. And it was kind of figuring out what I was going to do next. My dad was a business owner, started a company, and I worked for him and helped him build it. But he did it. You know, he did 99% of the work making a company out of it. So kind of... The natural progression of being a good Italian son would be do your family business, but I had an ambition for boxing. And I started boxing in Stockton, but I knew my interest level exceeded what Stockton would offer. So I jumped at the opportunity, I met Cuss, and after really a couple hour orientation, he invited me to stay. And so Mike was one of the fighters, there were many fighters that had come and gone, but if you flash forward four or five years later, Mike and I were Cuss's last two fighters to be living and training with him. Wow. So how many fighters did he have at a time? Did he have like a stable of people that were possibilities? Sure. Oh, there were some really talented fighters. There were local residents that lived there, and the young boys were in the gym training and fighting, and there were some really good fighters. I mean, Greg Young was a master boxer. His younger brother, younger, his younger cousin, Georgie Young, um, was you know tough as nails, but he didn't adopt the style. Cuss created a methodology of boxing, how to hit, not get hit, but do it in a manner that excites the crowd. Tyson epitomized it. He had speed, he had power, but he had the skill set that Cuss taught. John, put it this way. Go to any boxing gym around the world. Trainers will sit ringside and they'll watch their fighters train. Like, get in there, do your thing, be first, double up that jab, work the body, let that right hand go. Come on, Leo, be, do your thing. Basic kind of, you know, little coaching, right? Right. Cuss would sit ringside. Don't lay in the middle. Move your head. Move your head after your last punch. You're laying in the middle. You're not moving. Move your head. You're not moving. Constantly. That's all he talked about. It wasn't hit the body or attack or you know, double up on the jab. If you're not getting hit, you're not getting discouraged. If you're not discouraged, you're more confident and capable than somebody that might be on you know less defensive and kind of you know take a punch give a punch so and if you're competitive if you have a uh, you know, like you you're an athlete so if you're competitive you got that that will to win which you can't coach but if you got that determination and you've got bad intentions then yeah you'll make a miss 
but you'll also counter. You'll come back with snapping punches because you're now in a striking position without being vulnerable and Cus taught you exactly with split second timing where to move to next and then where to move next and then where to move next so that you're really truly not very susceptible while you're boxing. Now, it's a contact sport. You're not going to be 100% a hundred percent of the time. So, right. but if you are stung or you get hit, you get your bell rung and you slip and move and, and you're still evasive, you can get out of trouble. And if you're competitive, you'll stay in the match and you'll come back and, and you can win. So not everything's going to go the way it's planned a hundred percent of the time, like you're talking, but as long as you know where to go after that the stinger comes. Basic fundamental principles stick with rule number one, don't lay in the middle. Simple as that, right? Rule number two, don't pull straight back. Now you're in line, you're still in line for the attack. So you're gonna slip, move, spring, step to the side, you'll hit like military. Once upon a time, you look at the Revolutionary War, you see these guys march right up the middle of the field and, and you know, shoot each other out, right? Yeah, everybody line up yeah. right across the front. And then, and then you know, the devils, the, you know, the, the, the Americans that did this flanking and these ambushing and these you know, different surprise attacks. It was like, you know, that's so ungentlemanly. That's not the way <laughs> gentlemen fight, right? right? But it's the art of war. And Cus studied and perfected. And how he trained Mike and I and the other stable of fighters, who were some phenomenal fighters, um, how he trained them is different than how he trained Patterson and my dad. So I'd go back home and I'd, my dad would watch me and see boxing. He was like, well, that's not what Cus used to tell me. Or, you know, we'd compare notes. But Cus kept evolving and improving his style so that it really became. And again, if you looked at early Mike Tyson, he had an impenetrable defense. He was, you know, split second timing, speed and power to execute, but he there was there was very little vulnerability. I was ringside, let's say twenty two of Mike's first twenty five or twenty eight fights. I could count on one hand how many punches ever landed solid on Mike in those twenty something fights that I was at, and I'd probably have one or two fingers left over. I kid you not. Now you may get a glancing grazing blow. But I'm talking about a solid connecting shot that Mike would have to shake off and, and fight back. Not too often. That was because he had, he had studied and he worked to perfection. Now you were, what, five times Golden Gloves amateur champion? So I won five different state and Golden Glove titles from California to New York and uh, Massachusetts, six states in New England. I won different amateur title fights, but I never turned pro. So did you, you had the same exact style? Absolutely. So, I mean, it, were you as, what do I say, um, as evasive? I mean, as far as like... Absolutely. Uh, so, they, they, same thing. You wouldn't Absolutely. get hit. And the, the way that you moved, the way you were taught, really kept you... Um, is, is it on your toes? Is it... What, what, how, how do you... you, my, are, you, are, you were, are you letting them try to swing at you to wear them out and nope. you're just waiting for, no. I'm no, no matter what they do and in spite of what they do, I'm gonna put myself in a striking position and within split second timing of me being in that position, taking a shot and moving in anticipation of the only single punch that could be consequential. Oh, So it was just a synchronized position. Just imagine, for instance, obviously we're not able to stand up and de demonstrate, but let's say I slipped in to your right shoulder. So I've smothered that hand. You're now a one-handed punch, uh, okay. punch fighter. And in fact, the only punch you could throw is a left hook. So as I slip over to that position, I bang a shot to your body, uppercut or hook. Now do I count one 1,000, two 1,000? How well did my punch land? What's going to happen next? No. I've slipped. I've, str I've, I've struck my opponent once or twice, maybe three times, but not too often. Because you can't hang out there. You you're fighting a game opponent that's going to try to hit you, right? right. Counter punch and move, shift at positions. So I'm going to slip into position. I'm going to bang a shot or two, and I'm going to weave out of there. Whether you throw that left hook or not, I have negated anything possible that you could or would do to me. So now I've slipped over or I've weaved over to another position without possibly getting injured in any capacity. Now I'm in another striking position, and within a split second of arriving in that position, I will have already landed one or two punches and moved to another position in split second timing. So, and you watch Tyson, if you YouTube Mike Tyson head movement, whereas everybody used to think, wow, Mike's so powerful, Mike's so strong, Mike's so incredible. Uh-uh. Watch how he's slipping, striking, moving, weaving, and putting himself in, in a new position just spontaneously and, and rapidly, the moment he lands a punch, he's going to move to the next position. And that was Cuss. So that's why Cuss would sit there. Don't lay in the middle. Move your head. 
who have you had after your last punch? You're not moving. You're not moving. It was a broken record because he didn't want his fighters to get hurt. Now, the difference, I would ask us, come on, Cus, I'm ready to turn pro. He says, well, you're ready to turn pro when I say you're ready. And, you know, I'm game, but Cuss wanted to be very concise about when his fighters are ready. And while Mike didn't have a lot of amateur fights, and I probably had even more than he did, but while Mike didn't have a lot, he did have speed and power so that he could really capitalize on being in a striking position without being vulnerable. So let's say Mike had, if Mike had 40 amateur fights, probably 35 of them, you know, 30 plus of them ended in knockout. I had roughly 60 amateur fights and I had, uh, I think, 28 knockouts. So our ratios, Mike had a little faster, heavier hand. I was a middleweight. He, I think he punched faster than I did. And he was certainly harder, of course. So Mike, you know, now I fought with bad intentions and I knocked a lot of people out. But Mike had that extra element of snap and power that it's, it's innate. You can't train it. I, I had the bad intention, but Mike had that power that could really capitalize on being in, the, in different striking positions. So that's why he accelerated through the heavyweights. That is so interesting. I mean, just the, the, the thought that goes into it. You, you, you watch boxing and you watch some of these uh, heavy contact sports like that. And from a layman's standpoint, you sit there and go, oh, they're hitting each other. Right. You sure. know, but to hear all of the planning and coaching and things that go into it, it's just amazing. One of the biggest fallacies you'd, you'd see a boxing match and then in a, at the end of a round they say you know 65 punches thrown that round and 43 landed and 25 power punches they come up with all these statistics you know how they're doing there's some guys ringside going thrown 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 another guy's going power punch power punch power punch landed 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 and you know that's the compu box it's humans they've probably never been in the ring in their entire life they have no clue what they're even scoring they're not the official scores they have they don't have a trained eye that they grew up through amateurs and judging and scoring and watching and learning. So they really conceivably have no clue what they're even scoring, okay? If I was ever hit 25 times in a round, let alone a fight or the month, who the hell would be a boxer, right? So you're really not getting as much punishment as you think. For example, if as I'm talking to you now, something struck me in the back of the head, I have no way to anticipate it. It's a completely blind shot for me, right? That's going to be detrimental. But in boxing, if somebody throws a punch, and even in the last fraction of a second, or if, you know, let's say that light swung down from here I'm, as I'm talking to you, whoa, what was that? Now, I, my head flew as something came grazing by, but nature wouldn't allow me to sit there and you know, you know, tense up and allow it to clobber me full, full, full impact to my head. Right. So the fighters don't get hit. My whole point is the fighters don't get hit nearly as much as you think. And so... You know, I know that early on they were doing testing for MRIs and, and CAT scans and they were testing all these uh, boxers' brains and they were faulting the technology as not picking up all the brain damage. Well, maybe there's not as much brain damage as you think for boxers. Right. Versus in football, and as you know, I mean, you running, you're doing, you know, dead, you know, full, full speed impact and, you know, blunt force, full speed, and you've got a padded helmet on. So you're not going to get bruised or cut or a broken nose, but you've got impact to your head repetitively. That's not, that's not true in boxing. Right. So I know that um, you co-authored a book, and it was called uh, Non-Compromised Pendulum. Yes. Is that the whole process of uh, what you're talking about as far as cusses? Yeah. You, you would catch about 90%, 90 to 98% of everything we have to teach was in that book. And, and there's some videos and some, sometimes people are like, you know, it's in Russian and, and I'm explaining in English. So there's a little delay and hesitation to it all. But, you know, I break down the science and I teach it. And while Cuss was exceptionally guarded and only in the gym and it wasn't really open to teach other people because why would you teach other trainers how to be how to train fighters as good as yours guard right? it yeah so you really protected this and i really feel like the last legacy that we could give to the sport of boxing is competence and intelligence and i'm sorry to say but the sport has digressed when it comes to the science and the art and and the skill set once upon a time they were bare knuckle fighters and the trainers taught you how to slip and roll and move and the action wasn't very fast rounds would last 
minutes and minutes and minutes and a round would end when somebody got knocked down you drag him to the corner you smack you know, you you know, spray water on him you know fan him with a towel and get him to go back out and they go back out and they go back out these fights would last an hour or two these fights back in the early uh, at the end of the 18th century 1800s and early 1900s so then with gloves and headgear the speed increased there wasn't as much caution but there was a decline in the skill set. And the sad part about it is almost every sport has evolved. Swinging a golf club is a science. Throwing a curveball is a science. You know, shooting a basketball is a science. There's, there's specific science behind, you know, jujitsu you know, and the MMA. You know, all these great, fantastic disciplines and arts. Boxing is the only one missing competence and intelligence. It's not documented. It's not earmarked for skill sets of accomplishment, like, like many martial arts are. I mean, you're a purple belt, you're an orange belt, you're a red belt, or whatever they are, all obviously getting up to a black belt, one, two, three, five degree. There are levels of competency in boxing. There's none of that. You could turn pro tomorrow. Go take a medical examination, fill out the application, pay a fee, and, and pass the examination, the medical examination. You are now a professional boxer. Wow. That's it. That's all you have to do. You may have five amateur fights. You can lose all five amateur fights and, you're, and you tell your coach, I need to make some money. He turns you pro. You lose your next five professional fights, but you're making money and you're a pro fighter. Wow. I mean, is that good crazy. management? No. What, what, what trainer or manager would do that? Well, there's a lot of guys that are better shoemakers, as Cuss would say, than they are boxing managers. Cuss was a true manager of people's careers. He would never turn somebody pro unless they were ready and, and making sure there was, they, they were lacking vulnerabilities. Cuss had a fighter named Joe Giuliano back when there was only eight champions and only eight champions because the sport was controlled by the underworld. It was. It was hmm. and if you read Mike's book, my father, uh, myself, Mike, and, and a few others are contributing. You know, we contribute to the content. And, and it's a breakdown on how Cuss single-handedly toppled the underworld that controlled the sport of boxing. So Joe Giuliano was a world-class fighter. And he had a gambling habit. That was it. He would fight, he'd get money, and if he, as long as that money lasted is how long he stayed out of the gym. So he might fight on a Tuesday night, he might be back in the gym on Monday, or you may not see him for another six or eight weeks because the money lasted that long. Well, Cuss knew while he was capable of fighting and beating champion fighters because he would spar with them at, uh, at Gleason's and he was a world-class fighter. He was truly magnificent in the ring. But Cuss wouldn't turn him pro to, get, uh, to allow him to escalate up to fight these champions because the underworld controlled the sport. Well, they also controlled gambling, right? So then all of a sudden they come and say, knock, knock, knock. Hey, your fight owes us 200 grand. What are you going to do? Are you going to pay up or, or, are, we gonna, or are you going to sign over the fighter? So that fighter had a vulnerability and mm. Cuss wouldn't allow him to be a champion in those conditions. So Patterson came along and he was dedicated. He was true. He was focused. He was intent. He had a purpose. He had skills. He, had, he was coachable, which is very important in anything you'll ever do to succeed. And as you know, in the business you run, you have to have people that are coachable, that are interested in advancing and doing better in their life, in all aspects of it. Right. So, and that's what made a difference with Mike in his last fight with Roy Jones. He was listening again. I've trained him in two of his last training camps, and he wasn't interested in listening. But this camp, he was interested in listening to what we had to say, and, 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 and he was a student again. And the example was how he performed against Roy Jones. Mike outboxed the, the, what, someone that was supposed to be considered pound for pound one of the greatest boxers of his, his era. We well, don't lose your skills. Right. Perhaps, did he lose a little bit of speed or power? Maybe, but even that fighter had plenty of speed and power and speed and power to spare. So as a middleweight fighting in a heavier division, as he was capable of carrying weight, he had one time captured a portion of the heavyweight title. Mike outboxed him. That was the plan. Let's outbox the boxer. Let's look better. Show your skills at a higher level. Let's, let's exemplify your excellence. And that's what, instead of going out looking for a knockout, Let's go out there and show skills. And it was up to Mike to do it. Mike put in the hard work. Mike, while he may have listened, he also executed a plan of action that demonstrated excellence. It, I mean, at 54 years old, he looked like he was 26 or 7, in my opinion. I saw some and of the training videos. It was crazy. He was, it was fantastic. He had you know, speed and power to spare. He had head movement. He was evasive. He was, he was, he was in motion and outboxing the boxer. 
It was wonderful. It was great. And that was, that's a testament to not only Mike and his excellence, but the style that we learned. You couldn't see Joe Frazier in the ring in his 50s. You couldn't see, you, know, any, any, you name any slew of heavyweight champions. But for Jack Johnson, who was a great boxer in his era, he last fought when he was 53 and a half years old. So Mike even eclipsed that. And Mike's going to fight Holyfield again, by the way. He's got a match against Holyfield set. When's that going to be? I don't know the dates. I'm going to go see Mike tomorrow, and I'll start to find out a little bit and, and just check in. But he, he's, Mike's on track. I'm proud of him. I might be around a little bit to help, but I'm so busy as a county supervisor and, and taking care of what I'm doing that, uh, that if and when needed, I'll, I'll help Mike a little bit. But, uh, but Mike's doing great. I'm so proud of him. What's, uh, we're going to get into your business and uh, your public service here in a second, too. Uh, but what, what do you think has changed as far as you said, you know, Mike is listening now and taking direction. What do you think has changed as far as, is it just maturity? Is sure. it self-help? What, what's, what's going on there? Yeah, and, and that's a great question, John. I, what's changed is attitude, your perspective. I mean, at one point, you're, you're, A, you're disinterested. You have, yeah, like, I don't care attitude okay but that's only going to bring you so far and i'm not even saying i'm not saying that was necessarily mike but but as mike has admitted he just wasn't he didn't care about boxing anymore so now there's a new challenge in front of him and if you'll notice that mike in in the history of his life in spite of the disparity in spite of the challenges in spite of adversity he's capable of stepping up and rising up and bettering himself and and reaching you know new goals and setting setting a new level and a standard of accomplishment so that you know, i mean is it a quest for immortality? Sure. Is there a level of narcissism? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Aren't, aren't we all looking for yeah, that fountain of youth? Don't, yeah. Don't you want to be that? You know, don't you want to be immortal? Like you know, like talk about you for you know, generations. Right. So you know, Mike is one of the fighting gods. There's, I mean, without question or doubt, as there are many. Um, but you know, Mike has a unique place in boxing history, and he's not done yet. He still wants to cement. While the end of his career, his last couple of fights may not be the most favorable. He also doesn't want that to be the most defining parts of his boxing legacy. So he's back in the ring. He has a hunger. He has an interest. We'll see how far it goes. But he's capable of going quite far and, and, and taking it to higher levels if he's so interested. So um, being a close friend of uh, Mike's, you guys being close friends. That's my brother. What? Yeah, being brothers. What on a personal level i mean he just seems like different uh recent interviews he seems like the nicest guy ever i mean it's like he every once in a while he will say something kind of off the cuff but the rest of the time he seems soft spoken uh, very um he's, he's very careful with his words when he's talking to people mm -hmm. he just seems like uh, he's in a good place right now Mike's very gracious. Mike's very humble in many capacities. And there's a full spectrum and a dichotomy to Mike. Uh, Mike As there is to all of us, yeah, right? All of us. But Mike Scott, I mean, we know that, um, you know, Mike's gone through many tests and evaluations to get his boxing license back. And there's a lot of things that are publicly I mean, I've known the guy since he's just a te you know, young teenager. I taught him how to drive, got him his driver's license. Uh, he was too shy to even talk to girls. I used to coach him just to even talk to a girl. He was just so, so bashful. So there's a level of insecurity. Um, and so he's got a lot of challenges. But uh, sorry, you, you had a question in there. What was the question? I just, uh, I wanted to oh, know. How humble he is. And the, yeah. yeah. So there's a dichotomy to Mike. And I've seen Mike tell stories like, you know, I was on this plane, I you know, fall asleep and I wake up and now I'm the other Mike Tyson. <laughs> you know, so, so he can self-describe that you know, while he might be in a mood one way and he may take a nap and wake up and be cranky and then be in a different mood. But even when he's been in a bad mood and I mean, talk about bankruptcy and boxing license taken away and just all the weight of the world and divorce and all the travesties that you can imagine. Somebody will come over and Mike, can I get an autograph? And a little kid and Mike said, sure, come here. And he'd give a kid an autograph, even though he had the weight of the world and just, you know, where I, you and I might be like, listen, man, leave me alone right now. I'm, you know, my, I'm imploding. I need my space. I see Mike. Here you go. You know, and, you know, give a little kid a rub on the head and say, you know, you be a good boy. And, 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 you know, just give some, give something to someone else. Yeah. And so there is a, there is a very, um, a very soft side to Mike. When I was training him one time, it's like, where the heck is Mike after training? Couldn't find him. It was a, we were in a school uh, during the summertime. 
Now, go walking through the corridors, and there was a room of special ed kids. And he was in there just hugging and, you know, just you know, playing and doing coloring with these kids. And he, had, he was lit up the whole room. These kids knew who he was in some capacity. And you know, I just watched him for like a half hour, 45 minutes, play with these kids. And he walks out and we had to go somewhere. He walks out. He goes, he goes, he goes, when, I, he goes when I retire long, I'm done with boxing. He goes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to help kids. He goes, I love just doing this. You know, they're just so sweet and so innocent. And they don't ask for anything. He goes, they're just happy to, that, you're, that somebody's paying attention to them. Yeah. So there's that side of Mike. That's, you know, that's very giving and very you know, caring. Um, so again, there's a spectrum and a, and a full dichotomy. But I know in spite of where he's come from and where he's gone, and, and, and there's been trials and tribulations, and there's things that he's admitted he could have done different or better. Um, I know some of the things he's accused of that he's not guilty of. I know some of the things that, that he's done that he's, he, he's, he's, he has the character and the integrity to own that issue. Whatever it is. Yep, I may have not, not have done this. But I've definitely done this, and I, I accept that, and I, I, I'm working to be a better person. So there is that spectrum and that, that dichotomy, but Mike is, A, very intelligent, has a photographic memory. So he'd remember meeting you in Reno at some capacity, make no mistake. So you have a very intelligent person. You talk to him about life, politics, religion, human nature, sports, you name it. You have a very interesting conversation, very intelligent conversation about the subject because he's a very intelligent person. Right. That's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing all that. So we wanted to get in a little bit about you and your business. I didn't even know about your business until we started uh, digging into this stuff. So you own a crane company, right? Yes. In Stockton, California. Yep. Talk a little bit about that. When did you, uh, did you start the company or did you buy the company? How so my dad, when he moved out to California from New York, we moved here when I was a little boy. Okay. He started the company from ground zero, nothing. He didn't know three people in town. And he just knocked on doors and I can do this. I can build a sign for you. I can paint your sign. I can fix your sign. He was a sign man. And, and he did. He built and manufactured. And within six or eight years, he built a company. Up, I mean, within 10 years, he had 30 people working for him. And it was just cold calls, building, you know, hustling and working hard to serve customers and do it with a great quality product. So he did signs and with the sign business, you have crane trucks. So he did signs and cranes, AC lifting, mostly AC lifting. And so at one point he was going to sell the company. And I asked him, so, well, do you, he goes, I don't want to retire. I said, well, sell the sign business. I don't want it. That's all the headaches. And I'm trying to buy myself time. I'm living in Los Angeles. And I'm you know, acting and doing TV and movies and, and uh, traveling the world and having fun. So, uh, so I bought myself some more time of this possibility of doing a little family business and, and returning home if that was ever going to happen. So about five years later, he was ready to sell the crane business. And I thought, you know, I was an actor. I was doing TV, movies, and starred in about seven or eight different movies and what, guest what, star. And what movies were you in? That's the other thing I a saw. A lot of terrible movies. <laughs> a lot of terrible movies. Uh, a lot of low-budget things. But I did the lead role in a 10-hour miniseries. And I was off in Europe for six months filming this big melodramatic 10-hour series uh, called Oceano. And it went to Europe. In fact, I'm riding motorcycles through Europe one time. I pull into Rome and I've got a crowd of people gathered. Like, ah, Sebastian! And, you know, <laughs> Oceano! And I'm signing autographs. I'm like, is anybody noticing and get a picture? I'm, I'm like, know, I'm moving here. I'm, I'm famous for a minute here. And you <laughs> come back, of course, to Los Angeles and you can't get arrested. That's so, so funny. Um, so it was a great experience. And really, after 15 years, I'm like, this is a great hobby. But I mean, I sold a screenplay, I wrote and directed theater, and I was working, I, you know, I was doing okay, close on some big, big projects. But I really realized that you can be close a whole career and never get that massive breakthrough to be Bruce Willis or you know, the big action star you want to be or, or the, you know, the big working actor. So I just realized that I'm going to transition to a new thing. And my dad was going to sell a business. I said, you know, dad, I'm going to come home. And let's do this business. And I helped you. I worked for him when I was a kid. And this would be a great thing. The kind of the prodigal son coming home. And so I bought the crane business almost 20 years ago. And you know, bought another crane and then bought another crane. And kind of built the company to be a bigger company than what it first was. And so you know, I'm very proud of it. I got great people that work with me. And, and, uh, and, and, and we have a crane service that's, you know, cranes are running around as we speak. So how many, uh, uh, how... What part of the Bay Area do you service? 
So I'll do, based in Stockton, we'll really do a good 60, 70 mile radius. Somebody will okay. call us up and say, I want you and only your company in, Baker, in, in uh, let's say, you know, downtown Berkeley tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. We will be there. Okay. People like to work with, say, yeah, your guys know my signals. Your guys know how they, I know we can depend on you. You guys are always on time. I had a guy bring us up to Reading. He goes, I called another crane company. He goes, they didn't show up. That cost me time. That cost me money. That made me look bad to my customer. You guys are going to be there. I want you there tomorrow at 11 a.m. We will be there. It's about customer service. It's about accountability. It's about hard yeah. work. You know, and it's just um, with, with my company, it, it's the same thing. You know, it, from boxing to crane service to IT staffing, hard work, dependability. Yep. You know, it's just a discipline. All, all those things fit into every part of life. Think about how fragile relationships are. Oof. Think about how fragile and precarious. And here's an example. Joe Paterno, legendary coach mm -hmm. at Penn State, right? Yep. Statues, Papa Joe. I mean, this guy is an icon. Mentored and was coached and, and, and helped, you know, you know, I mean, with thousands of kids, right? And definitely overlooked some bad conduct and behavior from one of his coaches. And some kids that were most vulnerable that should have been the most protected right. were unfortunately under his watch. They were not protected and cared for. Overnight, his statues are down, his name is scrubbed, and, and like that, you're almost erasing all of his 50 years of history. Right. 50 years of history wiped out because of one discretion, ind indiscretion, whatever, whatever, whatever he didn't do that he should have done to protect the most vulnerable and innocent, he didn't. Right. And that wiped out 50 years. So in business, when somebody says, can I depend on you? Will you be there? You better, you better pretend like that's their first. That's, every opportunity that you have to serve somebody is, is that opportunity to make a great first impression. And if you don't, somebody else will. Well, it's, it's, it's about making, I agree with you totally, uh, about making a great first impression, delivering. If there is some kind of hiccup that happens, you better face it head on. Yep. You better take care of it. Because I've, it, I've had situations, my whole deal is dealing with human beings. So IT staffing, mm -hmm. I'm not staffing IT, I'm staffing people that sure. do IT work, right? Sure. So you've got human beings you have to deal with, and sometimes things happen. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to go in there and not bury your head in the sand. You have to work with these people and say, we're going to fix this as soon as possible. We're going to bring somebody else in there, whatever it is, and sure. just fix it. And if you face that problem head on, you also have a customer for life. Sure. Because many other people don't deal with things that way. Right. And they'll run the other way and say, sorry, didn't mean to do it. I'm not going to deal with it now. I'm going to go make money somewhere else. Sure. We're in the solutions business. Exactly. Somebody has a, a, a Leroy Neiman, you know, the, the famous artist. Yes. I said, yo, where do you get your inspiration? Why, how do you start looking? And he goes, a painting to me is a problem that I need to solve. Hmm. So somebody calls up and they said, I need somebody to staff. They have a problem. They have a need. And you're there to solve. You're there to provide a solution for their want and their need. Right? So that's what we do yeah. every day. Solutions. There are no problems. There's solutions that we, that we take care of for people. Well, let's go back, way back, and uh, talk a little bit more about your family. So do you have siblings? I do. I have, a, um, I have a sister, older sister. And then I had a little brother that died when he was 12 years old. Oh. That was very, uh, that was that an incredible impact. And you know, good, good, good young boy. He was a really good boy. I was, I always think, figured I was like self-destructive and you know, kind of on my own, you know, path. And I always thought, well, I could die, and then as my little brother can be the good Italian son and take over with businesses and, right, right. and be the good son. I had such a sweet mother. She was, oh my gosh, she's still with me. Of course, lost my dad a couple of years ago. Okay, but um, um, I was pretty rambunctious as a kid, like we all are. You know, yeah, we yeah. we're all finding our places and our ways. And I was never a troublemaker. I didn't start trouble. I didn't you know, pick on people or I defended everybody that needed defending. And so I was constantly in the mix of something to help somebody that needed something. What happened to your brother? He had a brain tumor oh. and uh, he died. He died pretty much uh, just, just right after the operation, but there was no cure. There was no, there was no better tomorrow for him. So, um, so he was a very good boy. He worked with special ed kids as a little boy. He was, he decided he was just he, he was just to spend all of his time helping and working with special ed kids. He was a really special kid to do. He pushed a kid in a wheelchair in a in a walkathon one time, 
and you know, just wanted that little boy to be part of the walkathon. He volunteered and did it. Wow. So he was a really good boy. And it was, uh, it was it's, it's tough. It, it devastated my dad losing his son. It just, it, he lost, you know, half of his life was gone when my little brother died. Well, as parents, I mean, they're just looking at it now. I have one child. You have an 11 year old daughter, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, I've talked you to my. You can't imagine it. No, I've talked to my wife before. And I, I, I go there in my head every once in a while. And uh, it, it's a horrible place to be. So yeah. I can't even imagine, you know, what a parent has to go through yeah. when they do that, uh, when that kind of thing happens. Um, so what, where's your sister at? She's local. She lives in, in, in Stockton and um, Florida. She, they spend their time. My brother's got a large international company, a lot of uh, um, um, road paving equipment. And oh. it's one, of, one of the co- few companies in the world that manufactures these big airport runway paving equipment and and uh, highways. You want a six lane highway? He has a piece of equipment that can do it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the four lane. I think they're it, it as wide as four lanes at a time. Um, so yeah, they travel a lot internationally and and spend a lot of time in Florida as well. They have a house there. So, what took you into public service? Did you kind of think in the back of your head for a while that you wanted to get into it? Or no clue, no clue, no thought at all. And, and so. I was watching my sister and brother-in-law do things for Red Rhinos, an orphanage in, in Kenya, started by some people in Stockton. They okay. would do annual fundraisers. I'm watching my sister. I'm like, she's really shining. I really appreciate my sister doing it. And my brother-in-law would host some political fundraisers. Like, you got to be involved in the community. So they asked me if I, would have, if I would ask Mike Tyson to come to town and raise money for Red Rhino. So we did. Mike came to town, and while he was here, we, we barnstormed around. We did probably eight or ten fundraisers for communities, veterans, and you name it. Went to schools and mentored kids and talked to you. Just outreach in the community. I mean, Mike Tyson's there. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah. So I, I stretched every minute of the day out into something for him. And he's like, well, come on. Where, let's go. Let's go. Let's keep going. So when it's all done, I'm driving him back, and we raised $100,000 for Red Rhino. That was a pretty big – that was their, almost their annual budget. So we're driving up to Sacramento. And uh, he goes, Tommy, I want you to do me a favor. I'm like, well, I'm actually sitting where uh, uh, Joe Zider gave us his, uh, a bust so, uh, that he chartered for us. And um, so we're, you know, we're sitting in the back. He goes, I want you to do me a favor. I said, what's that? And he goes, uh, I want you to run for office. I'm like, what in M- that Mike says this? are you talking about? He goes, Tommy, I'm telling you, man, you got to run for office. I'm like, well, that's the craziest thought. You, where's that even come from? He goes, Stockton's going through bankruptcy. Stockton's going, it's like noted as the worst city to live in. It's, he goes, I was, Mike said, he goes, I was nervous coming here. I've heard so many things. All my friends are saying like, don't go to Stockton. It's terrible. There's so much crime and there's murder and it's one of the worst cities in America. He goes, but I met so many great people. You, they respect you. You're reaching out in the community. You're making a difference. He goes, I'm telling you, you got to run for office. I dropped him off at the airport and didn't think a second or twice about it. Right? I'm like, get out of guy, my car. Like, get, see you later, man. I got enough. <laughs> I'm a single dad. I've just gone through a divorce. And I'm, uh, I'm just keeping my life together and running a business. And I got a little free time. I got crane operators working for me. So you know, things are going okay. Why complicate it, right? So then about a week later, I get a phone call and somebody says, hey, I want to meet with you for lunch. I'm like, I'm available for lunch. So we sit down. And he goes, you ever think about running for office? I'm like, you talk to Mike Tyson? <laughs> and he goes, no, why? I said, Mike said the same thing. I said, all right, what is this about? What, are you, what, are you, what, what, what you know, tell me about this. And the reality is it struck a chord for me. I had friends of mine. I moved back here. I was living in New York and L.A. And I was bi-coastal. I was living you know, I had apartments in both places. Had a pretty good life in great cities, right? A lot of friend, good friends and, and doing cosmopolitan things. But if I was going to raise a family, I thought it was going to be more in this home environment, that uh, smaller town. Right. But you realize that there's challenges. And a friend of mine's like, yeah, I told my daughters, you graduate college, don't come back to Stockton. I'm like, I just can't move back here. What would you tell them that for? It's a great place, good quality of life. And it is. Right. I mean, boating, the Delta, you've got your know, hunting, fishing, recreation, go, you know, go an hour in any direction. You can find new and great places from Tahoe to, the, to San Francisco. So there's plenty of things to do. And he's like, this you know, place is bad. It's no good. It's trending wrong. And I, well, what are you doing about that? That's what I kept thinking. What are we doing about that? How can we get involved and make it better? 
So I'm watching my sister do things in the community and my brother-in-law and I'm watching. So I've studied all these things. So when Mike mentioned it, it kind of did plant a seed. And then another guy mentions it and then someone else mentioned it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm in. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a difference because I'm going to raise my daughter in a community that I fought and worked for. And I improved the challenges. We're not going to fix problems. Right. 20 years from now, there's going to be poverty. There's going to be crime. There's going to be blight. There's going to be issues. You're not going to solve the problems, but you can manage and you can, you can work on changing the trajectory of where you're going or what's going on. And if I can do that, as long as I'm blessed to serve as a public servant, I'm not a politician. I'm a public servant. I'm entrusted by members of the public that voted for me two, twice now as a county supervisor to make decisions to the benefit of our community. And I live in the community that I make the decisions for. Now, in California, um, I grew up in Northwest Illinois. I spent 12 years in Minneapolis. And I come to California and I see so much opportunity here. Agreed. It is the land of opportunity. I've built a business here. I've built a family here. The weather can't be beat, you know? Well, you know, my family back in Illinois and in Minnesota, and gee, I have family in Texas who's getting pounded with cold, horrible weather right now. Yeah. And it's absolutely amazing to me to look around and see um, some of the waste that goes on here. Mm -hmm. And well, what do you mean the waste in what, in what capacity? Just the, the amount of money that goes out in this state, just in different things. I mean, it's, it's government programs, government programs, all of the different pork. It's just, it goes and goes and goes and there's never enough. Right. You know, and there's still all these problems. And just like you said, you're never going to solve every problem. But I totally agree with you that you've got to get involved in your community. Yep. And go out there and get something done. Because just like you said before, if people just sit back there and enjoy their lives and don't do something like you did, then you're kind of dying. True. You know, get busy living or get busy dying. You're not doing your part if you're not engaged. And while people, while the emotion is in Washington and Donald Trump and Joe Biden and Barack Obama and, and the, the emotions that go with that top of the ticket, let me tell you something. Your local election, who's on your local school board and the curriculum that they're approving for your kids and what they're teaching your kids and how they're influencing right. what your kids are learning in many instances may not be healthy. And so while we like to think we're evolving as a society and getting better, when you have curriculum that teaches how, how racist America is and how terrible it is and our bad past and how you know, Christopher Columbus came and, you know, and, and committed genocide, like, no, 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 no. This is your interpretation. This might be an ideology that you're professing, but this isn't actually teaching the exceptionalism of America. Right. What America offers now in the last 10, 20, 40, 30, 40, 50 years is much different than what America was 100 years ago or 60 years ago or 80 years ago or 200 years ago. It's, it's evolved and changed and progressed. But now to think and to teach that, you know, yes, you've evolved. Yes, it's gotten better, but you are so guilty. You are so racist. You are so, you're so anything. Is, is, is it's not doing justice for the exceptionalism that we are. And it's not to say that things can't get better. It's not to say that, that, there are, that, 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 that there are not people that are flawed that make mistakes. I don't care if you work, what your job is, whether you're working in the police department where 99.99999% of officers have positive and, and you know, good job performances, and you're gonna have some outliers as in every instance where something bad might happen. And they need to be held accountable, absolutely. And can we do better? Absolutely. Can we, can we nationalize uh, training and, and, and protocols of, of conduct for officers? Absolutely. Why is that not happening? Well, that's a deeper conversation. That's something <laughs> right. that, you know, that, that the unions need to embrace so that you know, across, forget about you know, across county lines and city boundaries, and, but you, know, you need an entire state to have a national you know, program of you know, this is the conduct. This is, what, this is what we need to do to be the most efficient, most effective, and to serve the public in the, in the most, I think, responsible manner possible. We, of course, need to have police. 
Right. Yeah, total anarchy without them. Right. So, you know, how do we do it? How do we do it in a manner that's, you know, that's respectful and decent to all of our citizens, but also with levels of accountability, levels of, of the interpretation and understanding of when danger exists and when it doesn't. What's your training? What's your protocol? Have you followed, you know, a, a, a best practice or are you following the routine that, you know, that the, that, that department trained, you know, for decades now? Right. So, so we know that we can always get better, but America is without question or doubt, one of the most benevolent, equal opportunists. There is not racism. If there's racism, please contact me. I want to put you in touch with lawyers. I will help you sue whatever organization, whatever body, whatever you find that racism, that systemic racism holding you back. You let me know and I'll be a champion. We'll come back on this radio and talk about the justice that we had to bring to the system right. that's suppressing somebody. I'm yet to see it. And I'm not saying it wasn't there in the past, but, but the reality is you are and this, this country is an equal opportunist. There are more people that have immigrated to America and came from dirt poor nothing and have, have achieved success than people that sit around and wallow and complain about the, the injustices that they, ha that they have. More people come here and, and immigrate and, and benefit from America's freedom and opportunities. People that want to sit around and complain, you've got excuses. person that's not winning is a person that has excuses. Well, I think that's what you're hitting on the head. Every person who has a bad attitude is going to stay Absolutely in that true. bad attitude way of thinking. Yeah. Every person who is working their ass off to get something better, they might fail a couple times. Absolutely. But you are going to get something better. Even if you, you might not strike it rich, but you are going to be in a better place and a better frame of mind because you're working towards something. It's progress, not perfection. There are studies out that have proven if you graduate high school, get a job and do not have children until you're in a stable relationship, you will graduate and move on and climb the social ladders and, and uh, the, the, the income opportunities and be in a middle class position more so than if you've dropped out of high school, have children out of wedlock and are caught in a rut. Right. Not to say there aren't loving, caring, very supportive parents and hardworking people that may come through some challenges and, 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 and raise successful kids. I mean, you know, my dad didn't graduate high school. My dad you know, just worked hard and, and found, found an opportunity to create business and, 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 a, and a direction to channel his energy toward. But your dad had the majority of the things that you just listed. He just didn't have the high school diploma. Well, he, he didn't have parents. What's he, that? He didn't have parents. He did it on his own. He had to make decisions. I always talk about a defining moment. To me, my dad used to tell a story. He was 13 years old, working in a gas station for five bucks a day. And a guy drives by with a convertible Cadillac with a beautiful girl sitting next to him. I want that. And my dad said, well, now, there's some people, though. You drive a nice car. You come back. He's like, why did somebody spit on my car? I'm, <laughs> You know, why does some of you scratch my car? Or, yeah, you know, they're just people out of spite or envy or you know, nastiness or their own, you know, their own self-hate that they you know, project onto others, right? But my dad looks at this, you know, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to save my money. And one day that's going to be me. And he did. He worked hard, saved his money. And, you know, when he was 23 years old, he's got a convertible Plymouth with leopard skin seats and my, and my beautiful mom sitting next to him. And he's like... You know, he's on his way. He, he I did it. Out. He did it. Just, just in, in what, these 10 years of making good choices and working to achieve something. So he's maybe an exception to the rule, but there are so many stories of people that came here. They immigrated to America with nothing. I know multimillionaires that used to work in the fields picking almonds and, you know, and, and, and harvesting you know, as literally farm labor. And they saved their money, they invested, and they pooled together with others, and they bought land, and they did a development. Or, or they you know, took the land, they bought it low, and they sold it high. And they just parlayed it and, and very, very carefully created fortune and opportunity and extreme success in a very short period of time. A lot of people in the Punjabi and the Indian community and, 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 and the Chinese community, people that immigrate here with nothing, but they have basic core principles. Family, so there's a, there's a mother and father structure, and not everybody's blessed to have that. Right. So again, there's a lot of people that work hard, but, but if you really look at you know, the increasing and maximizing the potential for success, it is really with you know, a, supportive, a, a supportive family structure around that person. I knew my grandparents. I knew my mom and dad and 
you know, had, had a loving, supporting, was it a perfect childhood? Was it a perfect environment? Absolutely not. There's a reason why I was compelled to boxing, right? You know, I had you know, my own frustrations and my own injustices that I needed to, to vent out. But in reality, I had a loving, caring, supportive family. There was a Christmas tree every year. There was presents under that tree. And my family worked hard to provide to us and those that we adopted and brought into our family and gave them more than they had. So, and still to this day, we've got extended friends of mine that, and my sisters that are part of our family because they had nothing. And right. we, we gave to them and they remember and, they, and they, their life blossomed because of it. So these are important values that you'll be teaching you know, your wife and, 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 and your son and you have a, this, this foundation that is, is it's very, not only advantageous, but it's very necessary and, and beneficial to exceed in life. So you know, for me, I'm in favor of you know, family, values, support, love, and, 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 you know, and a community that's able to nurture and, and provide opportunities for that next generation. Well, over this past, uh, what I was going to say before was uh, there's no shortage of opportunity in this country, and there's no shortage of money. You know? Correct. And it's like you, you just go out and make it happen. And you'll get all the all that you ever dreamed of. I mean, I, I'm living, walking proof of that. You know, one of the things I had to do was get sober because right. I was a drunk. And as soon as I got that out of my way, which is that monkey on my back, right? I had the good fortune of uh, meeting a bunch of people who gave me an opportunity in IT staffing, who taught me mm -hmm. just like Cus taught you. Right. You've got these coaches and these mentors in your life that are angels. Sure. They just all of a sudden step in and as soon as you get the monkey off your back and you get the disbelief and the doubt out of your life, mm -hmm. you can do anything. Agreed. You know, you just got to jump in both hands, both feet, go for it and it'll just happen. Yep. You know, so. Well, you don't get caught in the, God, it's going to be tough. You say, yeah, it's going to be tough, but I can do it. Right. So you got to turn that around. I always talk about a book, and when I go talk to youth groups and such, I bring copies and I give out and I promote. There's a really phenomenal book I'd like you to read. It's a quick read. It's, you, know, you can read it in a, a night or two, a few hours. It's called Happiness Advantage. I forgot the author's name. You can Google it. It's right. Happiness, Happiness Advantage. And it breaks down the psychology of success and living a happy life. And they've even done studies where they take the same exact, you know, kind of like even a baseline career. And they looked at people, and, and there's three categories. People self-identified their job as three categories. One is, I do a job. Next one is, this is my, this is my career. Okay, let's do a job, career. Next one is, this is my calling. Mm. Now, one person clocks in and clocks out, does their job, and they're efficient. That's fine. But, but you know what? You're going to get just just the hours in between the, 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 the time clock there. And when they're done, they're done. They go home and take care of what's, what's important to them. The other person, like, you know, I really enjoy, this is what I love to do. Well, the next person, like, no, this is what I'm meant to do. And, and they stress this in different professions. And the one that was most revealing was janitors that had a job, a career, or a calling. And their attitude, their perspective, that person that has a job shows up, does their job and, and you know, clocks in and clocks out. That person has a calling. They put in that extra effort and that, that extra level of not only enthusiasm, but satisfaction. They say, like, you know what? This is the future. This, I'm helping these kids have a better tomorrow. This is my responsibility to take care of this schoolroom, this school facility for that future generation and watching them grow and knowing that I'm providing what I, what I, what's my calling? My, I'm here to provide for their future so they have a healthy, safe environment. That's my responsibility. That person has A, lo, uh, greater longevity, B, more success in their career, higher pay scale, and, and, and more, a higher rating of their satisfaction in the quality of life they have. And it's, wow. just, it's just amazing. It's all your perspective. So your perspective becomes your reality. And we have a positive action and a positive result then you you know i mean the, the 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 limits are endless you can just keep going and go further and further and i've seen people work for my dad that good attitude bad attitude the good attitude guys last and they excel and they climb the ladder and the bad attitude you you weed them out and and they move on well i've been i'm sure you have too i've been the good attitude guy and i've been the bad attitude guy and uh you know uh the good attitude guy 
gets pretty much whatever he needs. Sure. You know, I don't always get what I want, but needs have always been, needs have been taken care of my whole life. God has provided for me what I could not provide for myself my whole life. Okay. You know, and I've never starved. Just look at me. Um, but the good attitude comes into play with what we just went through the last year and a half or so, a uh, year of COVID, right? And the first couple months of COVID, I was like glued to the news. And you were talking before about the talking heads, about Trump, about mm -hmm. Biden, about all And it, what I realized was none of that has anything really to do with me. When it comes Correct. down to it, so true. It, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do uh, it, my company. Um, well, first of all, my God, my family, my company, my community. That's really it. Mm -hmm. You know, and once I turned off the news, once I got off of most all of social media, my happiness went through the roof. Yep. And I just stopped talking about it. I stopped listening to the noise. Less stress. Oh. Less anxiety. I slept so well. Yeah. I still do. It's just like, I don't care anymore. These, these people, and I don't care if it's Trump or Biden or anybody else. They really don't have much to do with me. Totally agreed. You know, where it's like you, my friends, the people that I know around me, local people who are in um, public service, those are the people that, I need to stay close to and know what's going on. Good to go. Right. You know, because like you said before, that's who's going to mold and shape my kid is my community. Absolutely true. It's, it's very true. And being engaged. And listen, you can be engaged in multiple levels. I mean, I've, I've challenged myself to run for public office. I know guys that were coaches at Hoover Tyler Little League for 25 to 30 years. They mentored, they worked with, and they, they, they took kids that had little talent or awkwardness and made them into you know, better athletes and builds their self-esteem. So there's so many ways to have a positive impact. You have a coach, when you have a coach that's worked with kids for 20, between 20 and 30 years, you've impacted thousands of people's lives. You really have. You've, you've impacted them and how they're going to relate and how they're going to mentor and how they're going to coach and how, they're, how, you know, how they relate to others because they've got higher self-esteem. They've you know, won a championship when everybody thought they were a bunch of losers or whatever the circumstances. So mentors come in many shapes and sizes. And, and whether you're a great parent or you're a coach or you're a, a fantastic place to work, that's, you know, these are how we affect other people's lives and what they take out of it and what they need. Like you said, there's, you know, there's, always, there's always someone there. There's angels in your life that come along when they need to be there. But how many times, I mean, I'll go out on a limb. How many times have you ever been depressed? Plenty. How many times have you had hardship? Plenty. But you always believe like tomorrow's a new day. It's going to be better. I know I, can, I know I can do it. Tomorrow will be a new day. I can do better. And the fun part about it is to think back on all those days that were horrible, worst day of my life. And then you look back on it and go, I hardly remember it. Barely anything, right? You think like, this is the world. Life's not worth living, yeah. right? You don't know what it's like, Ed. Yeah. And then, and then you look back like, what was my problems last year that I was thinking like that? God, they're nothing. Right now I got problems, but back then they were nothing compared to now. <laughs> I mean, look, at, I had a career, that, not to you know, grandize about myself, but so I go from boxing, which is, a, this is a school of hard knocks, right? I mean, I had you know, plenty of Literally. cuts and you know, bruises and broken noses and surgeries and just to keep fighting. So you know, I'm in really, literally, in the school of hard knocks and living a Spartan life, isolated up in Catskill, New York, away from the rest of the world. We train seven days a week, right? So this is my goal, my ambition. And that's fine. It's what I chose. Then I go into acting. I'm choosing an act, a career in acting. Now, can you have anything more difficult than boxing? Then after that, I decide on politics. So the masochism, the self, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the self hating to you know, just do this to myself again and again. But you know, I love the challenges, and you know, and there's there's plenty of adversity and there's plenty of you know, hardships along the way. But you just have to rise to the occasion, no matter how difficult it may be. You got to find that like, yes, you can. I know it's difficult. Yes, there's plenty of doubt and there's plenty of doubters, but you got to believe in yourself and say, yep, I can do this. I can do better. I can do more. And you work hard to do better. And you may not win every election. You're not going to win every fight. You're not going to win every, you know, the, every role you go out and audition for. You know, you're lucky to get one out of 150 auditions. But you, know, you have to have that faith and that confidence that, you know, I can do it. It's okay. I'm, you know, even though I didn't get hired, it doesn't make me a loser. It doesn't make me bad. It just, you know, I wasn't right for what they're looking for. And that's fine. 
I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to get better at what I do. Well, the fun part is to go back and look at all those things that you or I have been through and then look at where you're at today and realize how every one of those things that you went through led you to being a better decision maker today Absolutely. in a completely different role. Yep. You know, it's like the roles that you were working on for acting, all the training, all the fights, all the things you went through as a kid growing up, going through boxing, you know, all of a sudden you get to this stage in your life and you look back and go, oh, that's why I went through all that. Yeah. And it's really an interesting thing. I'm, I'm writing a book right now called True Ambition and going through everything that I've done, mm -hmm. you know, from birth until right now. And then I sit there and realize, oh, it was all for this, mm -hmm. this point that I'm at right now. Well, and it's this also moment, for the, you're a parent. Yeah. You're going to teach your son great lessons and he's going to have choices. And he's going to live the life based on the choices that he makes and the effort he puts in to succeed or, or lack thereof. But with, with, with a good mentor, a parent that's gone through and, and, and realized and had a, an awakening and a sobriety and a, trans, a, a transitional moment in your life that's very defining. You know, look at that, what, what you're going to raise your son to be, what his capabilities and his possibilities are. Right? All, compress all that knowledge, all that experience you have, and you have a little... I mean, it's a little human, of course, but it's, it's like clay. You can mold them. You can shape them. I talk to my daughter. I teach her lessons like I'm going to, I teach her lessons like I'm going to die tomorrow because I want her to know the important things I've learned along the way. I truly, right. I, you know, I'm, I'm an older dad and it's not a poor me thing. I'm an older dad and, uh, and living lifestyle and getting whacked by cars and you know, things that, you know, things that had precarious situations I found myself in and not willing to back down. Um, so, you know, we're, both that kind of rambunctious guy, but I, I teach my daughter. So I, I, I repeat and teach and, and impart to her knowledge, useful knowledge for her to utilize in her life if she chose, so chooses. And that, that's me doing my job as a parent. And I think you, you'll be doing, you're doing the same. I'm you're doing the same thing. It's sweet just... little innocent boy. And that's, you know, you've got an opportunity to make him such a great little human being. Yeah, that's... It's absolutely a blessing to you. You said it that it, we're, we're both older fathers, you know, that didn't get anybody pregnant when I was 20. Right. You know, thank God. Yeah, yeah. That would have been horrible for that kid. Um, but now, you know, I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll be 49 this year, which is mind blowing to me. Kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing now that I'm able to actually impart some wisdom mm -hmm. to him. And again, looking back over all the mistakes and the triumphs that I've had over these 48, almost 49 years, sure. I really have some wisdom to give to him where before I think I was too selfish to even try to give something to somebody else. I was keeping sure. it all for myself. Yeah, we weren't there yet. We yeah. weren't ready. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you think about the opportunity he's going to have and, and, and what you're going to present, some opportunities as well. Here's some choices for you. Here's some, here's some opportunities. This is what I've learned. This is what you may want to consider. This is what I, I, you, you know, you'd, be, you'd be wise to, to choose your path. Yeah. And then see what decision he makes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You will live the life based on the choices that you make. Uh, you, there's no question or doubt about it. Like I got to talk about that defining moment from my dad. That guy rides by in this you know, beautiful convertible Cadillac with a, with a good looking gal next to him. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to save my money. And that's going to be me could have been he'd still be if he was wallowing in you know spite and envy and and you know, had animus towards others people being successful he'd probably still stay in that gas station his whole life yeah. working but he's like i'm gonna work hard i'm gonna do better what are some of the things that you're working on right now as far as um in, in your position in uh, public service so the number one issue of course is covid in the biggest primary responsibility we have is public safety and, 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 the, and the well-being of the people we serve. Okay, so we want to make sure we're getting vaccinations out. We've mobilized. We have utilized all of our assets. We are one of the only counties that could stage and do over 40, up to 40,000 vaccinations a week. Mm. We've got our, we got our act together. 
now we're missing the, the vaccination supply, but we are ready to do mass vaccinations from one end of the county to the next, okay? And then that's great. So we are prepared and primed and absolutely mobilized and utilizing all of our assets. So we know COVID is the number one issue. So I'm gonna message and people need to still get tested. Testing rates are down because people think, oh, the vaccine's here. No, we can still spread that virus. It's a nasty virus. I had it. I had two weeks, but I'm telling you, by day 12, I don't know and I don't I didn't care if I was going to live or die. I was like I'm done with this thing and I'm I am I'm on the brink of just, you know, collapse. I mean, it was, I was useless at uh, on day 12 and day 14 was it turned around, but you, you get your body gets beat up. You're da- you're just going down this path and you're just there's no it's relentless. So it's has there been a, relentless. when did you have it? Right after Thanksgiving. And about how a week after? Is there anything I've heard a lot I've read a lot of things about like leftover symptoms and things like that that kind of hold on is there anything lung left capacity over? so my lungs i had to go on steroids to get the coughing to stop and build rebuild the strength so um i don't know if there's anything to it but i'm an o positive and somebody says oh yeah that's the worst blood type to have to because the biggest all impact kinds is, of stuff. i don't know <laughs> i just know my mother had it she's 80 and she came through it and she had two and a half three weeks and she's rebuilding her strength so while I might be a you know poor me and even exaggerate you know how bad it was, but it was you know as brutal as it was, I really felt bad for the seniors because if I'm in this much pain and I'm this miserable and I'm just beat down, how are they doing in the right. hospital on a ventilator and you know alone and isolated? So you really feel bad for people. So that's why we want to get the vaccinations out. We want to get people to stay safe. We also want schools open. We want sports open. We want our kids reactivated and, 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 and doing healthy things for their emotional and psychological development. So that's paramount. We need schools open. So it's not a matter of if we open, it's how we open and let's do it with safety and protocols in place. So that's primary. My number one issue, if I was on the campaign trail today, people homeless, what are you doing about the homeless? And the approach of housing first that has been from the federal level to the state level to the local level is a dramatic failure. I will call it the way it is. They have failed dramatically. This is not a housing issue. This is a drug epidemic. This is mental health services. This is people that are in need. This is a human travesty. Now, trying to house your way out of it in the state of California, we are 3.5 million doors short of what we currently need. Single family house, apartment, you name it. We are 3.5 million short. San Joaquin County, we are 44,000 doors short. Every county is out a shortage, right? We have no growth laws. We have expensive CEQA and, and uh, uh, environmental impact reports and permitting fees. And the, the price gets so high that builders, the visionaries, the risk takers like, it's not worth it. I'm not building there. I may never make money if I do it this way. Right. So, so they can't do development until you lower that cost, the entry. Then we have 95% of this state is undeveloped. So we have 5% for housing and for cities and living, but there's no growth laws. So there's places that are off limits that you're like, well, you can't build. So the areas that you can build are so overpriced that you can't build. It doesn't pencil out. So, so now topple that with a housing first model. Well, if you're if you're 3.5 million doors short in the entire state, you're opening up the gates and letting more immigrants in, which God bless them. I love them. I'm glad you're here to work and want your way. And we are a country of immigrants as my family immigrated here. So I'm not against that, but we don't have an adequate level of housing for those that are most in need, those, those that are living on the streets and those that are facing hardships. So the most compassionate thing we can do, I believe, is create and emulate models of success. There's a place in San Antonio called Haven for Hope. There's the bridge shelter program down in San Diego. There's in, right here in Stanislaus in our backyard, they have a concrete tilt-up building, Salvation Army runs it. Half of it's emergency shelter, the other half of it is transitional support services. So you have a, people have a place to go, there's food, there's showers, there's a, a, you know there's a safe environment that you can come to and you should be at versus on the streets, living in despair and in squalor. And then there's the transitional component where you get some programs, you have support services to help you graduate through and be independent. So that's where we need to be focusing. Once you have the entry point where you've, you've, you've brought 
your services to central locations. You cannot be out in the field and go to see somebody that you saw weeks ago or months ago and then, oh, they're not here. Well, where'd they go? I don't know. They went somewhere else. And you're trying to track your case studies of people that need help or that you're trying to influence to try to bring them into services. You're going to, it's just, you're, you're, you're never going to catch up and you'll never be efficient enough with your time. So let's, let's enforce some, some levels of, um, of some levels of placement, the most compassionate thing we can do is enforce levels of placement where we take them out of the cold, we take them off the riverbanks or under the freeways and bring them to a place where there is clean clothing and there is there's you know three, three good meals a day and there is support services and you, you're bringing some human dignity back to them. It's a quality of life. People that are being beaten up every night because they're living homeless and they're raped or they're, they're you know, still they're caught in a vicious cycle of addiction. So let's bring those people. The most compassionate thing we can do is bring them inside. Bring them to a place where there's, there's a concerted effort, there's individual assessment, and you have levels of engagement that can help that human get back to a level of normalcy, a, a, level, a level of... of, um, of I think stabilized, you know, just a stabilized position where they can re-engage with their family. Where there was one fella I saw on the news, this is going back a couple of years ago, I think he was a homeless guy who got beat up or something, he got, got caught in something bad. And so that's my brother. Went down and picked him up and he needed mental, he needed medication. He was missing for two years, living on the streets. Well, that family member brought him home, got him a haircut, cleaned him up and had a room for him at the house. It was a Hispanic family where there's love and there's support. And there's a, you know, there's a, a focus on family, which is so wonderful to have that support network around you. But if you're lost and you're out in, in a wayward place and they don't know how to reach you, let's bring them inside. Let's engage. Well, where are you from? Let's get some identification. Let's reach out to your family, to your support network, and reconnect you. What's it take to bridge that gap? Also, the programming. What do you need? What kind of, what kind of addiction do you have? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Is it mental health services? What do you need so we can stabilize that human in the best and in the most comprehensive manner possible? And we improve the quality of life for those living in despair and those that are affected by it in the community. I have got people come to our board meetings. They say, look, my backyard fence is burned. They break the boards off. They're living in this you know, public area land behind us. They're, I got hypodermic needles on my kids' swing sets and all around it. I can't send my kids outside. The fence is gone. I have to repair it with plywood every night to, or you know, uh, you know, once a week. And, and it's not, this is not what I buy a house for. This is not where I want to raise my family. What are you going to do about that? We don't have a place to put them. Right. Let's create that shelter where there's support services. And that's, so that's really, truly what I'm focused on. In San Joaquin County, I've got, uh, we have a new mayor, uh, Kevin Lincoln in Stockton, and he wants to form a partnership. We've got, we've got organizations as well intent as they are and working hard and helping others in need. I, I want to work with them so we do a primary focus on these emergency shelters and we you know, improve the quality of life that those are, that are most in despair. So... That's a you know, big snapshot of what I've got. And then the other thing is, you know, you want less crime. You want to have a, a better economy. Jobs. Kids need, you know, kids need jobs. 18 to 24, instead of getting involved in drugs and gangs, you need to get you know, vocational training. You know, I, didn't, I didn't go to college. I learned how to operate cranes. I learned how to weld. I learned how to install signs and, and you know, make neon and, and do all the things that, that my dad's trade taught me. And I did well, that I think, since I, I think was that comes back to family. Yeah, you know, well, support, I, I, support network, an example. I saw my dad get up every day at, at you know, 5.30 in the morning and, and you know, get ready and go to work. And he was there at 6.30 and came home at, at, at you know, 5.30, 6 p.m. at night and family dinner every night. And then we talked about you know, the community and politics and, and business. Right. So I was lucky to have that. Yeah, and I, I didn't go to college either. I uh, watched my parents work their asses off. Yeah. And then they gave me a good moral compass. And that was pretty much, I mean, I, I still, it's funny to listen and the, the homeless thing is such a huge issue. And I, I, I can guarantee that, you know, 95% of those people, it's a drug alcohol issue, right? At, at least 85, yeah. at, at least 85. It's gotta be huge, right? Yep. It is. I mean, I'm sure part of it is mental, mm -hmm. maybe some PTSD, whatever's going on from their past, but you know, I, I, I'm in different meetings for my 12 step program that I'm in and I see and hear some of these people, mm -hmm. they want help. 
but they know they're going to go back out and do whatever they're doing sure. to cope. And some of them live on the street, you know, and it's just, it's a, it's a tough situation. It's a travesty. It's a travesty, but it's also a really hard issue to deal with. I mean, I, 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 my hat's off to public servants who are trying to deal with this because you're not only dealing with giving them a humane way to live, but you're also dealing with people that won't face reality and help themselves. Yeah. So you've got a real dichotomy there of, I want to help these people that some of them don't want to help themselves, but at least, at least we're trying to step up and do something. Yeah. That's that's right. We have to do. How can, like you said before, there's not enough money. Every every if I'm on fifteen to twenty boards and community and nonprofits, every single one of them, every single meeting talks about more money, needing more money, need more. Go to, and it's true. Go to the Child Abuse Prevention Council. They need more money to do more. You go to any any program for any. In any capacity, any program or any nonprofit, they all need more money to do more. And it's true. Mm -hmm. There's not enough money to go around for all the needs. And we also know that, you know, government and bureaucracies and the way some, some things are spent, you know, it's like nonprofits, like, and, and I'm not naming any nonprofits, but there's some nonprofits like, that guy's salary is 200000 Do you know that? And it's like, what? Yeah. So, but, but they do perform an essential service. And, and their board of directors... Have, you know, they, they, they get paid according to what they bring in and they pay according to what they're willing to put out you know, and, and create and, and, and benefit the community for. So I'm not disparaging and, and, and judging any of that, but it's, 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 there's a greater need than there is means to satisfy everybody's need, okay? So you know, how are we being efficient? How are we being effective with the dollars we have? and reappropriating and taking from one area to give to another because there's a bigger need with the homeless issues. Um, it's, it's a big challenge. It is a, a monumental challenge. And it almost seems like nobody's got it done right because there's, you keep repeating the same housing first, housing first, housing first. Well, you can't take a, somebody that's strung out on drugs, put them in an apartment go, we fixed that one, presto. <laughs> right. Here's some needles too. All done. They're doing that in San Francisco. They Horrible. take these homeless off the street, put them in hotels, and they're doing drug delivery service and get, make sure they have clean needles and, and, and an adequate drug supply while they're in the hotels. Problem right. solved. This is what we're doing with our taxpayer dollars? Right. Is this the best we could do? They spend almost a billion dollars a year in San Francisco for, I think it's roughly 6,000. I think their, their homeless population was around 6,000 people. We have almost 3,000 in San Joaquin County. You know how much we're spending? T tens of millions for housing. Yeah. But what could we do in addition to that? And people are threatened by me coming forward with ideas and they all think I'm going to take away their funding. No, I want to do more for more with more. It's that simple. I'm yeah. not looking to take anything away. I'm willing as a chairman, I'm willing to bring to the board of San Joaquin County so we have five supervisors. I want to bring to them the board an option to do more for more with more. And how that board decides is going to be up to the, the, the argument and the level of engagement that we're going to wish, wish to commit or not and the partnership we can form. So it's not a foregone conclusion, but I'm going to work hard to bring options that are additional to what we're currently doing because what we're doing hasn't taken anybody off the streets. Yeah. The population of homeless are still out there. Well, is there anything that uh, people in San Joaquin Valley can do to help? Well, there are those that believe in housing first and those that profit mightily from housing first. And they have a concerted effort and they have a lot of voices and they all champion, they write letters and we need more housing and the priority needs to be housing. And yes, sure. We need a little more homeless shelter and we've got those plans. And you know, in the next five years, we're going to get you know, a couple hundred more off the streets and, you know, and more. It's like, that's not going to help the 2000 we have out there. Whatever you're doing is not going to, to me, we need to understand all that you're proposing and work with it. And absolutely. We agree with this and do more for more, with more. That's not a threat. So we need people in the public to say, yes, we need more emergency shelters. We need to expand emergency shelter capacities. We support that. But also, they have to be willing to step up and pay for it. What kind of, what kind of consumer tax? What kind of property tax? If we have 200,000 properties in San Joaquin County of 800,000 residents, roughly, if we did, I think it was 120 
$120 a year times 200 that we have, uh, what, 200, we have 240, uh, 24 million extra coming in, something, something, and then whatever the math is. Um, so what could you do with that 24 million? You could run homeless shelters and increase the housing supply. So, so we need people to understand that this is, this is not going to go away. I'm going to offer some short-term solutions with a long-term plan, but you also have to be willing to say, yep, I actually like that my community is cleaner and better, and I support an additional funding mechanism to do this. That'd be 120 bucks a year? 120 a year. I, I think what people would step up and say, here's my 120 bucks. You would think. Yeah. I, did, I just did a survey, and... Number one answer was use the existing funding. Number two answer was do nothing. It's not my problem. And number three answer was raise, raise, uh, raise additional funds. So people don't want to do it. And there is, I understand that. We are taxed mm -hmm. enough. We have a, we have a, you want to talk about state of California. We're setting an example. We always, you always hear elected officials talk about how, you know, how we go and what we do, so will the rest of the country. Well, that ought to be a warning sign because we have a contraction of our population. People are leaving, companies are leaving, manufacturers are leaving. Everything's leaving California. Why? Because of what they're doing in Sacramento, because of the, the difficulties that, it, that, that they create for businesses to flourish. Most successful economies in, in our country, statewide, and or internationally are the countries that have the least amount of restrictions. Now, we don't want to burn the forest. We don't want to pollute the water. We want to be good stewards, but you cannot over-regulate. You cannot over-regulate. Somebody was up in Reno recently. They was, were back in town. They went to go do, they, wanted to, they bought a house. They're going to do a little addition on the porch or something. Went down to building supply. And they're from California. And they say, you know, I want to you know, build this little addition on my porch. Goes, well, what do you got? He goes, well, he sketches out what he's going to do. He goes, yeah, that's fine. He goes, you know, go ahead. He goes, well, what's the permitting process? Where do I submit my engineering drawings? He goes, well, it's your house, right? Yeah. You're going to build it to last? He goes, yeah. He goes, well, build it. He goes, you know, bring us the plans. We'll sign up and go. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. Because I walked out of there. He goes, I couldn't believe that they were that friendly and that willing. So in California, you'd have to submit engineering and architectural and, you know, permitting and environmental and all these, you know, major impacts and the fees to do it, it's like, you couldn't do it. Yeah. You just can't do it. So, so while we want to be careful stewards, there's such a point as over-regulating. Look what they've done in the forest. Right. Look what our wildfires. You know, it's, 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 there's an atrocity. And look at our water supply hasn't increased in 35 years. Population's doubled, but we haven't increased an ounce of water supply for the most part. There's no great big water reservoirs that have been built or increasing the level of Mount Shasta, which you could do. Nope. There's, there's, there are groups that will oppose it because it's contrary to what they believe. And so they, they, they use the legal system and they use, uh, you know, they, they use every means possible to impede what it takes to be sustainable, self-sustainable. And that's a problem. It's a real problem. Yeah, if we... Uh... My wife and I, our family, are actually Nevada residents, and we come down here a couple days a week, spend the rest of the time up in Nevada. Really? Do you? Because exactly what you said. Yeah. I mean, I don't have to. The regulations, the overregulation is just unbelievable what goes on in California. Yeah. So it's, uh, I get what the guy's talking about because I've went down to the DMV. Everything that I do in Nevada is so much easier than it is in California. Yeah. And I come from the Midwest. Sure. Everything's way, way easier in the Midwest. And it's well intent. I mean, you start a, you know, well, yeah, let's do a permitting process. By the time you're done, the administrative and the fees and this and it coupled on and, you know, and the advocacy for more money, we need to raise the fee, or more money, we need to get more money for it. It, start, it starts becoming cumbersome. The government does not do anything with stealth. Yeah. And it's probably the, the point that I brought up a while ago, which is, you know, the waste that goes on. That's probably what a lot of these people are thinking. It's like if you think, go up to somebody and say, if every one of you pays me $120, not me, right. <laughs> if give right. us $120, sure. we're going to take care of this problem. It's not going to be right away, but it's going to be pretty quickly. Right. Every person goes, sounds perfect, but there's a problem with trust that it's going to get done because of Correct. what's been done to them over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Right. You know, and they're just like, well, you've got enough of my money. So, so on that, to that exact point, 
is I want the proof of concept. I'm willing to bring to the board for consideration an allocation dedicated for, let's say, three to five years of doing exactly what we're, I'm proposing the board consider to do in partnership. And, and then you bring it to the voters. Do you want it to go back the way it was? Do you want us to shut this down? Or do you like that we've cleaned up your water, your waterways and your freeways and your public and private land? If you like that, then we're going to ask you to support our funding mechanism. It's not going to be a lot. It doesn't have to be a lot. Right. Just enough to make a difference. Awesome. But you have to have that proof of concept because there is a lack of trust. Yeah. There is a lack of, there's a lot of, a lot of people that over promise, but under deliver. Yeah. Well, it's like going to a client and go, listen, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. <laughs> what? <laughs> you right. know? Well, I'll pay you for that after it's done. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, one of the things that uh, I like to talk about and here is music because I'm a musician, Ed's a musician. And uh, I asked you at the beginning of this who some of your favorite bands were. And you said, you two, Bob Dylan, The Who, and Rolling Stones. And I was just thinking about it when you gave that to me. Like, th those are all very political bands. Do you, you know? look at them as political? Oh, yeah. sure. They're, they're, really? There's a social conscience to them. Yeah, I can there's, see. There's not too much in there. It's like, I'm going to go out and get the girl and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's, there's a lot of social conscience behind what they sing about and they stand for. Interesting, John. And it was interesting when that. I saw that. I'm like, it makes total sense. Um, I yeah, I never thought about that. Yeah, but that, that is interesting. Pearl Jam, too, by the way. <laughs> a big Pearl Jam fan. Again, another social. Yeah. Green Day is another, you know, some great music. I love I love. Music that a is you know has a meaning to it, but also I love the rhythm and the tempo of music. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb. I swear to God, I always uh, you know people are always like what? Are you? Jack Johnson is the worst musician on planet Earth for me. I know you may love him because you're I a hate musician. Him. Talk about Boro Malibu surfing champion Jack Johnson. I'm like, <laughs> I, excuse me, I just woke up from a coma. Did somebody just play some music on the radio? This is the most boring music. Give me some life into it. Man. Every song sounds the same. It's horrible. Oh, it's it's terrible. And people are like, Yo, I like Jack Johnson. I think he's. You know, I'm like, then you must have a boring life. There's no passion to this stuff. And oh, I'm yeah. sure he's a great guy and wonderful guy. If I ever meet him, I'll tell him, oh, congratulations on your success. That's fantastic. But I, I love, you know, I love that passion, that rhythm and that, you know, that where musicians are really synchronizing and, you know, bringing up the, you know, to a crescendo and, and back down. And I, I don't have that talent. Um, I've never pursued it. And, um, and so I really envy and admire those that, those that can. But really, if you look at music, I break this down. I talk to my daughter and she's, you know, I was just, you know, flutter with so much. But you look at, look at how music's changed. And let's just go back to the 50s. And I play 50s music on it. And you listen to the songs. And it's like, you know, holding you or when I see you. And, you know, by, you know when, I, when I, you know, holding your hand or kissing you, whatever. It's all you, you, you. Okay. Yeah. And then a very transfer, transformational situation happened in America. And I think the, the uh, Kennedy assassination was a dramatic pivot in America's future all right you saw a leader of the free world executed on tv it was played over and you could see this guy being you know your president being killed right and then you saw within year within a few years people with long hair and drugs and drop out and you know this whole social change okay there's a real pivot in america's uh, uh, america's i think you know present and future right so so but the, it was reflected in the music because the music became a conscious the music became a statement there was a, a message to the community whatever it was you know agreed or not agreed or whatever but there was the music had a social conscience to it okay then you went into the 80s and the 90s and some music kept you know changing there was you know music and, and and messages and such and then you know big hair bands and music was a little more fun but my point in ending getting to Music now, so there's no more band, there's no more garage bands, so to speak. You go to a studio, you create, you, you, you sing and lay down a track that somebody wrote or you, if you're talented enough to create it, but you haven't, in many instances, you haven't worked as a team to develop your rhythm and your message and your, and your, you know, that garage, the garage band is missing, okay? So now you have music that's all narcissistic. It's all me, me, me. I'm the greatest. I'm the coolest. I'm the this. The party doesn't start till I arrive. You know, you name it. It's all fun. It's pop. It's cool. It's you know, it's got a zip to it and great. You can find you dance. It's you know, it's lighthearted. Can I say something real quick? Yeah. It's garbage. Yeah. It, it, in in many uh, instances. This is my show. I'm saying it's garbage. Yeah. Now there's. Uh, it's just so narcissistic. It's it, all me, at, me, me, me. As me. a person who is a musician and a huge fan of music, when 
you get on stage and play music with a band, mm-hmm. um, some, it's a team. something happens yeah. where, you know, because you get up and sing karaoke and it's just stupid. But you get up there with a the band and you've got a crowd of people. Something happens with that crowd of people. Mm-hmm. It's a night. It's yeah. an event. There's something special that happens there with all those people. Yeah, you know, and it's synchronizing. It, yeah, and, from it, it, from stage and to the audience. Would I, that yeah, correct? exactly. Yeah, I never you know? thought about that, but yeah. Oh, it's it, it's it's a magic thing that happens between everybody that's in that venue in that room, mm-hmm. and you take it away, and we as the musicians, you know, get to walk back afterwards and just feel amazing. It's a high, right? Oh, it's a total high, and because you're communicating love, mm-hmm. you're communicating hate. You're communicating mad. Right. You're communicating happy. Whatever it is, and if you're doing it the right way, then those people on the other side are communicating it back to you, right? And feeling it and taking it in. Sure. And like that's something that. that's just not done today. You know, I, I yeah. listen to it, and I, we talk about it all the time. It's just like there's no heart and soul behind it. It's just what you talked about. Give me a beat. You yeah. know, where the DJ and, is programming beats and, and somebody's be, singing over it. may be entertaining. You're watching dancers dance, but there's not a connection like you're talking about. There's not a rhythm that's been synchronized. It's just a beat that's going down in there, you know, singing in there. In there. So it's you know, channeled in and it's computer enhanced. So it's, it's, it's really cheating. You're cheating the, I think you're cheating the performance and you're cheating the reward on whether you're the person watching or you're the person you know, performing and, and, and they're missing out on, I think, how great they could be. 11 year old, her name's Presley, right? Presley. Presley. What does she listen to? Does she listen to any of the older music? Absolutely. We listen to, I've got, um, I've got a station like, you know, BB King and, and, um, you know, you know, all the great music, you know, that, that, that were back rhythm, you know, R and B. And, um, so I've got a couple different stations. You know, I got like a Bob Seger station, I got a U2 station, and I've got a BB King station. So we listen to different music in different places. I mean, listen to Ella Fitzgerald or Billie Holiday or you know Sam Cooke, and listen to these great you know Pendergrass. I mean, you need these great artists and the 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 talent they had. Their 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 voice was an instrument that mm-hmm. they worked. You know, Sinatra, you name them. Oh, these yeah. great singers and what it took to be great. It's not computer synthesized. Right. These guys were purists. Nat King Cole. I mean, you listen to you know, Sam Cooke, if I, if I said him already. I mean, these great voices and the music that they created, which was only possible coming out of the big band there and then in the 50s and the rock and roll and the transformation and, and the influence and the cultural um, you know, the impact and, and, and influence. And, of course, um, you know, going down and listening to uh, the d- down in uh, down in Louisiana, and, you know, the, down the down in the Bayou, listening to all those you know great old musicians, you know the blues, you know, those blues bands and stuff that that you get a chance to be exposed to. And Rolling Stones talks about how influential that was when they went down and listened to American blues music, and they're like, man, listen to the soul of that music, right? And and so you really appreciate that these people, and they and it, it stirs a depth inside of them. Yeah. So I so I exposed my daughter to that. We don't really do much hip hop or, or rap in my house. So I just kind of give her, and she made with her mom, and that's fine. I'm not against. You know, it's the kids are going to listen to what they're going to listen to. But I wanted to know the difference between music that's narcissistic and music that has a message or a meaning or a rhythm to it, and 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 a depth. So that's one of the things I just try to expose her to. Well, I hear a lot of the kids um, in our neighborhood. Um, cause Johnny's old enough to listen to like Mickey Mouse and, uh, Bluey and some of the other yeah. <laughs> cartoons, yeah. Great. but all of the kids around there, they listen to mostly eighties and nineties rock. Right. Cause I was watching a, uh, an interview with uh, Gene Simmons and he was saying that the last bands, the last real bands mm-hmm. were the end of the nineties. I agree. And then they're all gone. Yeah. And, uh, the the question i used to hang out with gene simmons in new york city did you really oh it was great man what a great guy he was really really good guy oh well he was talking on this uh interview and the interviewer asked why are you still touring he goes he said because people want to see a band yeah and he said as long as we have a good product and we can go out and do what i was talking about before which is convey some kind of feeling to these people Mm -hmm. they're going to keep coming and he said after nirvana after like the Foo Fighters, mm-hmm. after bands like that, there's no more bands. 
So he said yeah. those bands will be able to keep on going out as long as they have a good product. Yeah. Until you know they're eighty or ninety years old, like right. the Rolling Stones, Stones are today. Stones are out there still. I yeah. Mean, God bless them, right? It's because they got a product that people yeah. want to go and experience. Yep. You know, but after that, what it, are people going to go out and you know watch Britney Spears when she's ninety years old? Yeah. I doubt yeah. it. You know, yeah. th there's there's no feeling there. Yeah. It's just uh, it's contrived. You know, and it's just it. I look forward to whatever's going to happen next with music because so, something's got to happen. I would think. I don't know because the you know, the record industry has changed. It's all it, there's a digital platform. So whereas a band used to be at, get you know prove themselves and get signed you know, by an A and R you know, a scout, so it's just the whole dynamics changed. The money is not in the record sales anymore. Right. There's a digital download, so you don't even need a studio. There's a lot of artists that have created their own success just by through the digital platform. So it's a really interesting transition and a, and a, and a pivot in music and, and expression. I, I just, I'm really um, you know, concerned about it. It's just, it, to me, it's digressing. I mean, right. I was out on the, the, the Delta um this last summer and the music that they're playing on these party scenes at the ski beaches and all that stuff i was like i got my fill for the next show <laughs> for the rest of my life i got i haven't heard enough of that music for the rest of my life i don't need to do that again yeah and it was really it was kind of embarrassing that that's music and that's what everybody's grooving to as they're partying on a weekend and like wow yeah but well, what a what a change and uh I hope something else comes out of it, and uh, I'm sure that somebody's going to figure something out. Our artists always do, you know. So there's the the really good thing. I, I had uh, Josh Kelly on the podcast. Um, he's a country singer, and uh, he was telling me that without the record companies in between, mm -hmm. he's making more money today than he ever did okay. before. Great. So with uh, YouTube, with the Clubhouse, which Facebook with all the different avenues that they have, but it's going to be different. So it's some, some something's going to be figured out. We just don't know what it's going to be. Yeah. I, I remember being in, I was did a motorcycle trip through Europe. And one time I was in London with some friends. He's a, he was an engineer. He went to the studio and he was going to lay down some tracks to somebody. I'm like, where's the band? He started laughing. He goes, let's, we don't need bands anymore, man. He goes, there's no studio musicians and nothing. He goes, it's all, it's all digital tracks. And this is going back a while. And I was like, really? So I don't know. I don't know. There's those garage, those garage bands are there. Like you know, Gene Simmons is talking about. There's no great bands anymore. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't. I, I'd I'd love to see it. I'd love to realize it and know that it's still part of our 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 music enterprise. And well, we and can't wait for COVID to be done so we can go back out and play some music. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, and it's true. You're you're held hostage. You there. You can't do these events. But um, but yeah. I don't. I you know, it's. To me, it's there's supply and demand, okay? And so where is the demand? And you know, is there an opportunity for guys to say, look it, you play guitar and you play drums and you know and bass and I'm gonna sing and we go, wait, wait, you're a better singer, okay? I'm better I'm better. You figure it all out, you write mirror music and it sucks, and you know, people laugh at you <laughs> and it, and you you do one of those like, yeah, everybody loved that one, and you know, you build your repertoire. I don't is that the, is that around anymore? I don't know. I, yeah. I I really don't know. I don't know. I'm I've realized while we're talking here that uh, I, we kind of sound like my dad. Absolutely. <laughs> Music's not like it used to be when we were kids. Said yeah, every parent, this is horrible. <laughs> said every parent in the history ever. You know? <laughs> I remember my grandfather who was a ballroom dancer and uh, talking about how uh, you know the big band music in the twenties and the thirties, you know, before the rock and roll, this you know, fandangled rock and roll thing came along, right, and ruined music. And, oh yeah, yeah. But he was a you know big ball. He was a ballroom dancer. And so you know, that was his music. And you listen to the stuff in the 50s, like, that isn't music. That's not even talent, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it, it does change, and we do date ourselves. But, uh, um, yeah. But I think, I think we're right. There's going to be performance. There's going to be something. I, I agree. Yeah. I, I don't think my dad was right, but I think we're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're coming to the end here. Um, like I said before, this is called the True Ambition Podcast. And uh, we had talked about it before. Um, I'm in a 12-step program. One of the books that I've uh, leaned on uh, through that 12-step program had a quote in it that kind of changed my life. And it says, the true ambition, and you, like pretty much everybody else on this podcast, is a very ambitious person. And says that true ambition is not what we thought it was. 
True ambition is the profound desire to live usefully and walk humbly under the grace of God. When I read that, kind of changed my perspective. Um, prior to that, my ambition was to get the girl, get money, get things, you know, all that kind of sure. crap, selfish sure. things. Um, what I tried to do and what I've done is change my perspective to go out and help other people. Um, my question at the end of the podcast is always this. You've done a lot of things. You've been a lot of places. Being where you've been and doing what you've done, knowing what you know now, what is your true ambition moving forward in both your career and in your personal life? That's a great question, John, and, and really look at the, 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 the vastness of it. When I was an actor, when, first when I was a boxer, I wanted to be middleweight champion of the world, right? I used to have a burning desire. I always wanted to be able to walk into a school and tell kids to live a good life and work hard. And so it was interesting from a young man, I wanted to have an influence. I wanted to be an influencer for people, you know, stay off of drugs like I did. I, I made good choices. I worked hard and I always wanted to just mentor people to do that. But I had very selfish desires, okay? I was a boxer, then I was an actor. And you, know, you want to reach success and financial recognition of financial stability and possibly still be of an influence that I got into a business and I was doing things pretty much for myself. So you really start to look at it as like I was pursuing a lot of things for myself. What I do with that success would yet to be determined. I don't really know how if I would have made millions of what I would have done if I would have lived in a bubble or if I would have been the most altruistic celebrity or middleweight champion ever. I don't know. That's yet to be determined. Um, so what I do know is the most satisfying thing that I've realized in my life is doing for others, helping others. That's my gratification. Imagine a simple little thing. You see a you see an older gal and go, you open up the door for her. Oh, thank you, young man. And a little little uh, you know manners and a little congeniality and and you know giving somebody a, a little helping hand for something, carry a box for somebody stranger that's struggling. Right? You feel good after doing that. And so when you can magnify that and do more of it, it becomes addicting. It becomes something that you really thrive in. It's like you know I can make a difference. I can I can you know do better. Like. Like again, on stage, and there's this, you know, you see the swell of emotion that people, you know, enjoy, and they, you know, escape through you, and and you see this emotion. They're laughing, they're, you know, singing, they're, you know, crying, and with the sad melodies that we all, you know, that you guys the bands throw in. So, you know, it, it's 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 intoxicating to do that, and you want more, you want to help more and do more, and so that's where I'm at in my life. Is you know, I am a public servant. Um, I have to play the political game to get there, but I want to earn. And if I'm not as an elected, I still, and as I was before I was elected, I'm still serving my community in some way to make it better and make it a better place for my daughter. And so that's what drives me is, you know, I know I can, I can do more. I can, I can make it better if I, if I focus my time, attention on it and, you know, use common sense and, and, and a passion to make a difference in a positive way, not for my own self-worth or for my own um my own benefit but to benefit my community because my community needs some some help my community as tyson recognized you know your community is is struggling it's got a bad reputation there's a lot of good people here they need your help and so it was a call to action that mike gave me and and i embraced it and i've sought the opportunity to do more and to to be I would hope a positive influence for people that need something from their representatives. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being here today. It's been a great podcast and uh, maybe uh, down the road here after we get some of these things done, we'll have you back and we'll talk about some of the progress. Absolutely. But more importantly, I appreciate you and, and you guys for what you're doing because you're, you're, you're leaving a positive message to everybody that wants to listen and wants to go on a journey with you. And this is a long conversation and it's filled. And I know you, know, you may take snippets and put it out there for people to learn, but, but the journey you're on and, and how you're mentoring within the community and beyond with this technology is, is very important. And, and I really appreciate that you're doing this. A lot of people talk about what they'll do, but you're, you're putting you know, pencil or pen to paper and writing a book you're, you know, you've created this enterprise, this podcast to reach people that can take a person that might be depressed or might be challenged or struggling or, or even thinking on the brink of suicide, as many people are because of COVID. Right. That's, that's all increased. 
but you're you know you're putting it out there that you know you can do more and you will do more and 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 we we together can make a difference so you're giving a lot of people hope and direction and, and understanding that they wouldn't have if you weren't reaching out and and risking exposing yourself really to the, the, these truths that are hard to say you know, yeah i'm an alcoholic or yeah i got this problem or yeah i had to do better these are truths that are hard to recognize or to expose like yeah that guy you know like you could people could say dismissive things about you or me and judge us because we're exposing ourselves to that what's well, the fun the the great part about what you just said there is once you expose your true self something that was a problem in the past you take all the power out of it True. it's gone true you know and that, that's what it's really done for me and i think if more people who are watching this right now would just be honest you really if you're just willing to ask help the door's already open you yep. can walk right through it there's no lock there's no key there's no nothing doors open just walk through it ask somebody else for help and you're good to go yep true very true so well, i appreciate you being here tom patty Thank hey, you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Thanks for uh, tuning into the True Ambition Podcast. We'll see you next time. The True Ambition Podcast is brought to you by IT Avalon. For more information and links to other episodes, please visit www.trueambition.org. Now, go find your true ambition. And I'll be